Ibn Battuta once said, I met in, Brusa, the pious Sheikh Abdallah al-Misri, the traveler, and a man of saintly life. He journeyed through the earth, but he never went into China nor the island of Ceylon, nor the Maghreb, nor Londulus, nor the Negro lands, so that I have outdone him by visiting these regions. With that mentioned, let's dive into this episode of Voyages of Ibn Battuta which will be a summary about the travels of Ibn Battuta and on later episodes we'll cover the in-department travel analysis from North Africa to China and everywhere he went in between. The Western world has narrowed the history of the expansion of the human race by grouping it around the people of Israel, Greece, and Rome. While completely ignoring the great travelers who sailed to the Indian Ocean to China Sea, or rode across Central Asia's lands to the Persian Gulf. Therefore, in short, the larger part of the globe was left entirely out which were no less civilized than Rome or Greece by the Western writers who were under the impression of writing the world history. Abu Abdallah ibn Battuta has been appropriately celebrated as the best voyager of pre-modern times. He was naturally introduced to a group of Muslim legitimate researchers in Tangier, Morocco, in 1304 during the period of the Marinid Line. He contemplated law as a young fellow and in 1325 left his local town to make the holy journey, or Hajj, to Mecca's hallowed city in Arabia. He required 18 months to arrive at his objective, visiting North Africa, Egypt, Palestine, and Syria en route. In the wake of finishing his first Hajj in 1326, he visited Iraq and Persia, at that point got back to Mecca. In 1328, or 1330, he set out upon an ocean journey that brought him down the eastern bank of Africa as far south as present-day Tanzania's locale. On his return journey, he visited Oman and the Persian Gulf and returned to Mecca again by the overland course across Focal Arabia. In 1330, or 1332, he went to India to look for work in the public authority of the Sultanate of Delhi. Instead of taking the ordinary sea course across the Arabian Sea to India's western coast, he voyaged north through Egypt and Syria to Asia Minor. After visiting the district, he crossed the Black Sea to the fields of West Central Asia. Because of chance conditions, he made a turn towards the West Diversion to visit Constantinople, capital of the Byzantine Empire, in the organization of a Turkish princess. Getting back to the Asian steppes, he voyaged toward the east through Transoxiana, Khorasan, and Afghanistan. Showing up at the Indus River banks in September 1333, or 1335. He went through eight years in India, the more significant part of that time involving a post as a Qadi, or judge, in the public authority of Muhammad Tufluk, Sultan of Delhi. In 1341 the Sultan selected him to lead a conciliatory mission to the Mongol Khan of China's court. For somewhat more than two years, he went about southern India, Ceylon, and the Maldive Islands where he served for around eight months as a Qadi under the neighborhood Muslim tradition. At that point, despite his ambassadorial mission's disappointment, he settled in 1345 to go to China all alone. Going via ocean, he visited Bengal, the shore of Burma, and Sumatra's island at that point, proceeded to Guangzhou. The degree of his visit to China is unsure however was most likely restricted toward the southern beachfront area. In 1346-47 he went to Mecca via South India, the Persian Gulf, Syria, and Egypt. In the wake of playing out the Hajj services one final time, he set a course for home. He showed up in Fez, Morocco's capital, going by both land and ocean, late in 1349. The next year, he made a short excursion across the Strait of Gibraltar to Granada's Muslim realm. At that point, in 1353, he embraced his last experience, an excursion by camel troop across the Sahara Desert to Mali's kingdom in the West African Sudan. In 1355 he got back to Morocco to remain. He crossed the Eastern Hemisphere's broadness throughout the travels of over 30 years, visited regions identical to approximately 40 present-day nations, and put behind him an absolute distance of roughly 73,000 miles. In 1356 Sultan Abu Inan, the Marinid Sultan of Morocco, authorized Ibn Juzai, a youthful abstract researcher of Andalusian birthplace, to record Ibn Battuta's encounters, just as his perceptions about the Islamic universe of his day, as a Rila, or Book of Movements. Ibn Battuta's Rila is an exhaustive review of the characters, places, governments, 
customs, and interests of the Muslim world in the second quarter of the 14th century. It is likewise the record of an individual emotional experience. The Western world has traditionally observed Marco Polo, who passed on the prior year Ibn Battuta initially ventured out from home, as the best traveler ever. Ibn Battuta has definitely been contrasted with him and has typically given second prize as the Marco Polo of the Muslim world or the Marco Polo of the tropics. Ibn Battuta ventured out to, and covers, a considerable number of a vast number of spots than Marco, and his story offers subtleties, in some cases in coincidental pieces, in some cases in long disquisitions, on pretty much every possible part of human existence in that age from the regal formal of the Sultan of Delhi to the sexual traditions of ladies in the Maldive Islands to the gathering of coconuts in South Arabia. In addition, his story is definitely more close to home and sympathetically captivating than Marco's. Marco went as an outsider guest into lands, not many Europeans had ever seen and whose individuals knew close to nothing, and minded to think nearly nothing, about Europe. He was a peculiarity, a stranger in an unknown land who was permitted to visit China simply because of the uncommon political conditions that won for a brief time frame in the 13th and mid 14th hundreds of years, the presence of the incomparable Mongol conditions of Asia and their arrangement of permitting merchants, everything being equal, and religions to travel and lead the business in their spaces. Paradoxically, Ibn Battuta burned through the greater part of his voyaging vocation inside the social limits of what Muslims called the Dar al-Islam, or abode of Islam. This articulation grasped the grounds where Muslims prevailed in the populace or where Muslim rulers or sovereigns governed over non-Muslim larger parts. Subsequently, the Sharia, or sacred law, of Islam was probably the social requests establishment. In that sense, Islamic civilization stretched out from the Atlantic shore of West Africa to Southeast Asia. Also, Muslim significant minority networks occupied urban communities and towns in areas, for example, China. Spain, and tropical West Africa past the Dar al-Islam outskirts. Hence, wherever Ibn Battuta went, he lived in with different Muslims, people who shared not only his doctrinal convictions and strict customs, but rather his virtues, social goals, and regular habits. The awful Mongol triumphs of Persia and Syria somewhere in the range of 1219 and 1258 appeared to Muslims to undermine Islamic civilization's actual presence. However, when Ibn Battuta started his voyaging profession Mongol political strength over the more critical piece of Eurasia was demonstrating helpful for the further development of Islam and its organizations. It was in the late many years of the Pax Mongolica that Ibn Battuta made his fantastic excursions. It could be said, he partook, once in a while at the same time, in four unique surges of movement and relocation. To begin with, he was a pioneer, joining the walk of devout adherence to Mecca and Medina's otherworldly sanctuaries in any event multiple times in his vocation. Second, he was a lover of Sufism. Third, he was a juridical researcher looking for information and intellectual organization in the extraordinary urban communities of the Islamic heartland. Lastly, he was an individual from the proficient, versatile, world-approved of first class, an informed globetrotter figuratively speaking, searching for neighborliness, praises, and beneficial work in the more recently settled focuses of Islamic civilization in different locales of Asia and Africa. He viewed himself as a resident, not of a nation called Morocco, but rather of the Dar al-Islam, to whose universalist profound, good, and social qualities he was steadfast over some other faithfulness. Thanks for watching episode 1 of our series on Ibn Battuta, don't forget to like, share and subscribe for episode 2.